Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And I am seeing you once again with lecture 7 of modern drama that is mo novel 2. Sorry, modern novel that is novel 2. Um, what we are going to do in, this, in today's talk is primarily uh, Joyce's use of imagery and we are going to discuss the questions of um, his autobiographical um, novel. However, we may also discuss the bits of the end of the story. Uh, in fact, in the last lecture, um, in lecture 6, we covered uh, our discussion on, uh, on the story development in the chapters and we had a critical um, discussion on the development as well. However, I said that I may like to revisit and the discussion regarding the last few um, bits of the novel. So, this is going to be the start of the lecture 7 and if we get time we may also get into the themes a bit more and we discuss few of them in detail. So as far as the end of the novel is concerned uh, you see that by the end of the novel there is another transition happening in, uh, in Stephen's character. Joy's transition to journal entries at the end of the novel is a formal change that highlights. So this 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 introduction of change, introduction of formation throughout the novel has been indicated through different, different ways, at times by bringing change into writing style, at times by bringing change into the use of diction, at times by bringing change into the layout of the text. So this is going to be a layout change. You will find the journal entries to be the core text of the novel towards the end and this indicates basically a formal change that is highlighted. Stephen's continuing search for his own voice. The journal entry from form explores the problem of representing a person through words and that is the ideology behind that. Stephen is no longer being talked about by an external narrator but is now speaking in his own voice. So to stand for himself, to present um, his voice and to, to emerge, uh, to let himself emerge into his text, he is not taking help of any external narrator or someone who is describing what is happening but speaking in his own voice as a journal entry. So this form is, is highly significant because it also frames the final section of the novel with the first which opens with a different external voice, Mr. Dedalus telling his son a story. Throughout the novel you will see that Stephen has continued his, his search for a voice, his search for identity, first drawing on others voices, um, citing Anquis and Aristotle as um, authorities and quoting Elizabethan poems and later realizing that he must devise a language of his own because he cannot be happy speaking the language of others. Bakhtan's philosophy. This last section of the novel finally offers um, a glimpse of Stephen's succeeding in doing precisely that. We finally see him um, imitating no one and quoting no one, offering his own perceptions, dreams, insights and reflections through his words alone. And at this point you will find no allusions at all. Stylistically, his section is not as polished, as structured as the earlier portions of the novel were, but this lack of polish indicates its immediacy and sponta spontaneity of expression and sincerity then in Stephen's mind. Nothing is revisited. It is as pure as coming from uh, Stephen's um, uh, Joyce uh, interpretations. Now Stephen's idea of femininity become more complex in the final section of chapter 5 when he finally confronts Emma and talks to her on Grafton Street. Stephen's relation to females throughout the novel has been largely conflicted and abstract to this point. This meeting with Emma, however, is concrete, placing Stephen himself in control. The conversation with Emma emphasizes the fact that women are no longer guiding Stephen. 
His mother no longer pushes him, the Virgin Mary no longer shows him the way. And prostitutes no longer seduce him. Women are no longer in a superior or transcendent position in his life. Finally, in actually speaking with Emma face to face, Stephen shows that he has begun to conceive um, of women as fellow human beings rather than idealized creature. Um, he no longer needs to be mothered and guided as his emotional, spiritual and artistic development has given him the vision and confidence to show himself the way. So, this was all about our discussion regarding the end, ending bits of the novel. And now we are going to step in uh, discussing references from the text and try to, we will try to explain them. I may not be covering all of them, but I may direct you to what to do and how to do. So, upon once upon a time, and a very good time it was, there was a Mako coming down along the road. road first few lines and this Mako that was coming down along the road met a nice little boy named baby Tako. His father told him that story his father looked at him through a glass he had a hairy face he was a baby Tako. The Mako came down the road where Betty Be Byron lived she sold lemon plate. Oh the wild rose blossoms on the little green place he sang that song, that was his song. Oh, the green boot boothined. Well, when you wet the bed first, it is warm. When it gets cold, his mother put on the oil sheets that had the queer smell. These first lines of a portrait, um, in, in these lines, the writer attempts to capture the perception of a very young boy. The language is childish, Mako, Tako, and Nysense are words a child might say, or words that an adult might say to a child to meet his expectations, linguistic expectations. In addition to using childish speech, Joyce tries to emulate a childish thought, processes through the syntax of his sentences and paragraphs. He jumps from thought to thought with no apparent motivation or sense of time. When we have no idea how much time goes by between Stephen's father telling him the story and Stephen wetting the bed. Moreover, the way Stephen's thoughts turn inward reflects the, the way child see themselves as the center of the universe. Stephen is the same baby Tako as the one in the story his father tells and the song Stephen hears is his song. As Stephen ages, uh, Joy's style becomes less childish and more of an adult-like. Tracking and emulating the thoughts and feelings of the maturing Stephen as closely as possible. Um, Corpus Domini Nostri could it be? He knelt there, sinless and timid, and he would hold upon his tongue the host, the host, and God would enter his purified body. Invitam entrum, amen. Lines from Latin. Another life, a life of grace and virtue and happiness. It was true. It was not a dream from which he could he would wake. The past was past, corpus domini nostri, the ciborium had come to him. These are the lines um, where Joyce uses a technique and he uses this to indicate the development of Stephen's consciousness is to end each of the five chapters with a moment of epiphany in which Stephen recognizes the fallacy of one way of life and the truth of another. This passage is basically the epiphany that ends chapter 3, the moment in which Stephen understands that he must turn to a religious life, a shift in his life. The passage also demonstrates one of the most revolutionary aspects of Joyce's narrative style, um, whereas other con confessional novels usually involve narrators looking back at the events of their youth with an adult perspective, a portrait 
um, is not mediated by such a detached voice. When Stephen declares another life, and the past was past. We are given no indication that Stephen's religious life is eventually replaced by a calling to an artistic life. Rather, just like Stephen, we are led to believe that he will remain religious for the rest of his life and that the arrival of the um, ciborium symbolizes the arrival of his true calling. In this sense, we experience the successive epiphanies in Stephen's life just as he experiences them, knowing that a change is being made to, um, to life as he has lived it up to this point, but not knowing where this change will take him in the future. His throat ached with a desire to cry aloud, um, the cry of hawk or eagle on high, to cry Piercing of his deliverance to the winds. This was the call of life to his soul, not the dull, gross voice of the world of duties and despair, not the inhuman voice that had called him to the pale service of the altar. An instant of high flight had delighted him, and the cry of triumph which, ha which his lips withered cleft his brain. This passage from chapter 4 demonstrates joy's contentation that becoming a true artist involves a calling, an urge, not a conscious decision that artist can make himself, but a um, nature-driven um, action that eventually leads to one's destination. These thoughts fly through Stephen's mind just before he sees a young girl waiting at a beach. The sight of her image leads to one of the most important epiphanies in the novel. Stephen sees her not longer after he has refused the, pre the priesthood, a time when he is unsure of what to do now that he has re re relinquished his religion, religious devotion. So at this, at this moment, Stephen finally feels a strong calling and determines to celebrate life, humanity and freedom, ignoring all temptations to turn away from such a celebration. He has already scumbled, scum, scummed to temptation twice. First, a dull gross voice, voice causes him to sin deeply when he um, scums to the squalor of Dublin and second an inhuman voice um, probably a, a mysterious voice um, superhuman voice invites him into the cold dull unfeeling world of the priesthood both of these temptations as well as the calling to become an artist are forces through which the outside world acts upon Stephen in this context, the passage suggests that it is as much fate as Stephen's own free will that leads him to become an artist. The language in which we are speaking in his before, it is mine. How different are the words home, Christ, ale, master, on his lips and on mine. I cannot speak or write these words without unrest of spirit. His language, so familiar and so foreign at the same time will always be for me an acquired speech. I have not made or accepted his, its words. My voice holds them at bay. My soul frets in the shadow of his language. Can you recall these, the exchange of these dialogues when he, meet, when he met the dean at the university? This quotation from chapter 5 indicates the linguistic and historical context of a, of a portrait. Stephen makes this comment during his conversation with the Dean of Studies. The Dean who is English does not know what Tundish means and assumes it is an Irish word or with Irish background, um, although it is not. In a moment of patriotism, Stephen sympathizes with the Irish people whose very language is borrowed from their English conquerors. The words Stephen chooses as example in this passage are very significant. Ale and home show how a borrowed language 
can suddenly make even the most familiar things feel foreign. Christ alludes to the fact that even the Irish religion has been altered by English con uh, occupation. Finally, Master refers to the subordination of the Irish to the English. Stephen's new awareness of the borrowed nature of his language has a strong effect on him, as he knows that language is central to his artistic mission. So language bears a lot of importance for the writer, as well as for the character. By the end of the novel, we see that Stephen acknowledges that Irish English is a borrowed language and resolves to use that knowledge to shape English into a tool for expressing the soul of the imprisoned Irish race. 26 April, some, some pieces from um, his journal entries. I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to forget in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscious of my race. April 27, old father, old artificer, stand me now and ever in good stead. These final lines of the novel proclaim Stephen's aim to be an artist for the rest of his life. The phrase, the smithy of my soul, indicates that he strives to be an artist whose individual consciousness is the foundation for all of his work. The reference to the, to the uncreated conscious of my race implies that he strives to be an artist who uses his individual voice to create a voice and conscious for the community into which he has been born. The final diary entry with its reference to old father and old art artificer reinforces Stephen's twofold mission basically. He invokes his old father which can be read as either Simon Dedalus or Ireland itself um, to acknowledge, to acknowledge um, his debt to his past. He invokes the old artificer, his namesake Dedalus the master craftsman from ancient mythology to emphasize his role as an artist. It is true as art that Stephen will use his individuality to create a conscious for his community. That is what he aims at now. Well, that was all for um, the important references that I could pick from the text and could um, let them uh, be easy for you to understand. However, um, if you still feel that there are there are few lines that you may find uh, complicated, you can refer back to our discussion based on different chapters. Any important line would definitely be there and I would have discussed it. If I did not discuss it in detail separately as a reference to text, I might have, um, uh, you know, uh, included them into discussion when I was doing the summary and analysis of the chapter individually. Uh, the very first and quite important question is that how is Stephen influenced by his Irish nationality? Because at times we find that um, Stephen's character holds a kind of dichotomous um, relation with and this national affair. At times you find him being sympathetic for this affair towards Irish people. At times you feel that he's taking side of the uh, um, Protestants. So this clash between his Catholic and Irish personality, which one to go with, is quite confusing throughout the novel. Let us see how can we best describe the answer to it. Stephen has a conflicted relationship to his Irish nationality largely because of the fact that his family and friends have conflicting political views about Ireland and its de independence. On one hand, Stephen, um, Stephen's governess, Dante, is proud of the church and Catholicism that, he f that she follows and disdainful of Irish leaders like Pan Panel and is quite happy with his death. On the other hand, Mr. Dedalus and John, John Kesse see Parnell as the only hope for a free land. Uh, Stephen's friend also stand on opposing sides of the, of the question. So influenced by these divergent opinions, Stephen, though eager to leave Ireland by the end of the novel, is also inextricably 
tied to it. He feels some bond between his land and himself. He feels that Ireland has always been at the mercy of other nations, just as he always has always been bound by outside influences. He's talking about himself. So somehow he could find the similarities between uh, his own you know, experiences and the experiences of his land. When Stephen leaves, it is to forge the conscience of the Irish race, a project that, ironically quite, he feels he can accomplish only by leaving his native island behind. He wants to break these bonds, to stay isolated and do his job honestly and um, devotedly. So, if we need to discuss Joyce's use of religious imagery and language, why are Father Arnold's three sermons so successful in, in overcoming uh, Stephen's religious doubts? So how will you frame your answer? A suggested frame is that you may discuss Father Arnold's sermons touch um, Stephen at his core because they um, resonate with both Stephen's cultural background and his preoccupation with aesthetics. At the same time, when Father Arnold delivers his sermon, Stephen is struggling with the exact issue the priest addresses, the overwhelming strength of sinful emotions and the fear of being punished for them. You remember we discussed that he is at the right point keeping the right energy of this want and urge to know exactly what is told by Father Arnold. When Father Arnold speaks, he validates and solidifies Stephen's vague concerns about morality and heavenly punishment. Um, moreover, the cultural context in which Stephen has been raised creates an intolerable tension between his desire for various freedom and his desire to meet the moral requirements placed upon him. Um, additionally, Stephen, who is closely attentive to the sensory world around him, particularly connects with Father Arnold's vivid portraits of the sensory experience of being in hell. In addition to focusing on spiritual tortures, the priest describes the raw pain and grotesqueness of hell, painting a moral and religious punishment in emotional and aesthetic terms. He does not only take care of the spiritual tor tortures, he also uh, delivers a detailed talk about the hell, the physical uh, pain, uh, punished, uh, punishments for physical self. As Stephen is just awakening to the power of such emotions and aesthetics, he feels very much attracted to Father Arnold's sermons and at the same time these sermons are answering the questions raising in his mind, this becomes a kind of double uh, uh, effect of uh, whatever is happening. Father Arnold's sermons have a particular uh, resonance, f uh, uh, resonance for him. Stephen's conversation to devote religiousness is, however, only temporary. The same tools, tools Father Arnold uses to such great effect in his sermons soon convert Stephen from a world be priest of religion to a confirmed priest of art and that is what has his destination is. Another um, quite um, curiosity embedded question can be that what role does Stephen, Stephen's burgeoning sexuality play in his development as a character? How does his Catholic morality complicate his experience of his um, um, sinful life? Uh, Stephen's early life is dominated by moral restrictions embedded in the society, culture, um, surroundings, um, background and family environment surrounding him. And his coming of age process involves confronting and dismantling these restrictions. Stephen grows up um, enthralled by the, by the hierarchies and rituals of school and church a structure in which his growing adolescent lust is not acknowledged or validated. His newfound sexuality is so alien in fact that he initially fails to recognize it. 
and it is not until he falls into the arms of the prostitute that he realizes what he has been longing for. The encounter with the prostitute awakens Stephen to a side of his character that has until then been hidden. The encounter symbolizes not only his awakening sexuality but more generally his awakening to the power of emotion as well as art. It also illustrates this extremely polarized conception of women. On the one hand are prostitutes with whom he can express his feeling of uh, all the um, desires and on the other are re revered, distant, nearly saintly figures such as Emma and then um, Virgin Mary whom he loves from far, far but can never approach. And another um, challenging question can be compare and contrast Stephen's perception of art with his perception of religion because these are the two extremes that he has experienced and I would say probably two phases of his life um, and then perception of family, school or country. What makes art such an appealing escape for Stephen from all this? Eventually he becomes a priest of art. Um, what you can add um, as your major argument in the answer to this question, for Stephen, art offers an escape from the constraints of religion, family, school, as well as country. Constrained by his surroundings and even his own self-imposed restraints, he looks to art as an in independent, abstract realm where he can create a world full of colors, beauty that suits him and his nature and his needs. Stephen's obsession with aesthetic theory um, indicates that for him art is an abstract idea. Unlike the abstractions of religion, however, the abstractions of art are tied to the emotions with which Stephen struggles. In his love poem to E.C., for instance, he finds that an outlet both for his aesthetic uh, leanings and for the emotions that he is too restrained or afraid to express. And another question can be that why does Stephen run down the offer to become a Jesuit, a priest of religion? Religion is Stephen's life up until the point where he is offered the possibility of entering the priesthood. After confessing his sin, he has tried to purify himself and he has gone and crossed all the boundaries of that and, and, and in fact followed this stream so religiously and devotedly that time came in his life he felt priest-like in himself. Um, and his superiors noticed this remarkable devotion and change and transformation and altogether transformed self of Stephen. It would seem that an offer to join the Jesuits is the perfect culmination of a life that, aside from occasional lapses such as liaisons with prostitutes, has been des destined for religion. Stephen, however, um, rejects the Jesuit offer as soon as it is made. Joy suggests that Stephen clings to religion not because it is his calling but merely as a source of stability within his turbulent life. He uses religion in an attempt to erect a barrier against the emotions that rage within him. Furthermore, um, Stephen has a strong aesthetic objection to the idea of being a priest, an objection that is um, emphasized by the washed out character of the priest who offers him the position. Even if the religion, religious life appeals to Stephen on a, on a religious or abstract level, uh, the idea of walking, dressing, talking and living like a priest is aesthetically quite dull, colorless and unpleasant for him. At this point in the novel, um, Stephen's aesthetic inclinations have become so strong that he almost inevitably rejects anything that contradicts these aesthetic values. Um, 
Now some directions for critical thinking. Um, how do Stephen's parents uh, affect his, uh, no, these were the questions, major questions that we discussed so far. However, there are many other several minor inquiries that would come up into your mind. Some questions that I could put together um, are here and we will try to see how we are able to find answers to them by the discussions coming forward, uh, coming forward discussions. Um, I want you to think about them while now we are going to start the themes, discussion on themes, you may get answers for these questions. So you have to be active listeners. And these questions are, how do Stephen's parents affect his development throughout the novel? How does the, the, he react to his father's patriotic nostalgia, to his mother's solemn Catholicism? At the end of the novel, why does Stephen feel uh, feels he needs to escape from his family. Um, the passage at the very beginning of the novel re recreates Stephen's early childhood in a sequence of memories and perception. Are these passages effective in recreating the thoughts and feeling of a very young boy? Why or why not? This question addresses the stylistic feature of Joyce writing. That's a hint I can give you. How does Stephen's aesthetic theory relate to the doctrine of Christianity or the behavior of hedonism? I just discussed the answer to, the, to, to this question uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the questions that we discussed in critical questions. Now, compare and contrast Stephen with some of the other boys and young men with whom he associates. How is he different from them? How does he feel about being different? And here we can include a complete character sketch of um, the hero as compared to some important sketches or traces from the sketches of other characters. And then, how does the setting of the novel affect the characters and the plot? Well, um, let us have some more critical insights by discussing Joyce's use of imagery. Um, Joyce uses several types of imageries and symbols. Um, however, whatsoever uh, devices he uses in his writing is to add the, the, the grand, grandeur of the, the thematical grounds that he presents. Uh, however, the major imageries and symbols that he uses in his writing are wet and dry imagery, hot and cold, light and dark, colors and names, and the flight imagery. You will see most of them are basically um, quite contradictory in nature. Uh, why does he present a contradiction? What can be the aim behind this particular style? I would want you to observe that. Um, although Joyce is frequently praised for his mastery of the stream of consciousness, a technique of 20th century, a narrative technique, his distinctive use of imagery has contributed much to the artistic development of the 20th century novel. So he's not only known for the stream of consciousness, but for the use of imagery too. And he has basically originated, um, uh, given quite new techniques of using imaginative diction. Especially in a portrait, he uses imagery to establish motifs, identity, symbols and provide thematic unity throughout the work. Perhaps the most obvious use of imagery in the novel occurs um, during the novel's first few pages with the introduction of the sensory details which shape Stephen's early life. Wet versus dry, hot versus cold, light versus dark. All image of dichotomy which reveal the forces which will affect of affect Stephen's life as he matures. If we can understand this imagery style, then we can better understand Stephen's reason for deciding to leave Ireland. The wet and dry imagery, for example, is symbolic of Stephen's natural response to the world versus a learned response. Um, now, natural to learn response. As a small child, Stephen learns that any expression of a natural inclination, such as wetting the bed, is labeled wrong. The wet sheets will be replaced by a dry, reinforcing oil sheet, 
and a swift unpleasant correction for inappropriate behavior. Thus, wet things relate to natural responses and dry things relate to learned behavior. Other examples of this wet and dry imagery include the wetness of the cesspool, the square ditch um, that Stephen is sh shoved into and the illness which follows likewise the flood of adolescent sexual feelings which engulfs Stephen in wavels causing him guilt and shame. Seemingly wet is bad, dry is good. So a turning point in this pattern occurs when Stephen crosses the, the trembling bridge over the river Tolka. He leaves behind his dry, withered heart as well as most of the remnants of his Catholicism. As he wades through a long rivulet in the strand, he encounters a young girl described as a strange and beautiful seabird. She gazes at Stephen from the sea and her invitation to the wet life enables Stephen to make a cl climatic choice concerning his identity as an artist from the p priest. Later after Stephen has explained his aesthetic philosophy to Lynch, rain begins to fall. You remember I, I drew your attention to this rainfall. Seemingly, the heavens approve of Stephen's theories about art, as well as his choice of art as a career. And that is the symbolic um, significance that uh, presents Joyce's use of rainfall here. The cold and dry imagery, the cold and hard imagery similarly affects Stephen. At the beginning of the novel, Stephen clearly pre prefers his mother's warm smell so that of his father. For Stephen, heart is symbolic of the intensity of physical affection and in some cases, sin. Cold, on the other hand, is symbolic of propriety, order and chastity. Um, specific examples of this symbolism can be found in Stephen's memories, resting in his mother's warm lab, being cared for by the the kindly brother Michael, when Stephen is recovering from a fever in the, in, uh, in the infir infirmary and receiving a heated embrace from the Dublin prostitute during his first encounter. In contrast, the cold, slimy water of the square ditch is evidence of the cruel reality of his changing life at school. In addition, Stephen initially experiences a cold, indifference when he thinks about the Belvedere retreat and his vision like worship of Eileen, the young protestant girl, has coldly symbolic um, touch me not over tones, her hands pure and white enable him to understand the re references to the tower of irony in an oft repeated church um, litany. The last of his, this set of opposites is concerned with the light and dark dichotomy. Light symbolizes knowledge, confidence, and dark symbolizes ignorance, terror. Numerous examples of this conflict pervade the novel. Um, in an early scene, when Stephen says that he will marry a pro protestant, he is threatened with blindness, put out his eyes and apologies. Stephen is terrorized without knowing why seemingly a good Catholic boy should remain ignorant about other faiths and perhaps even of women. Well, Stephen's natural foundness of for Elian is condemned, highly condemned rather. Stephen is only a boy but his sensitive artistic nature realizes that he is going to grow up in a world where he will be forced to suppress his true feelings and conform to society rules and threats, something that an artistic nature cannot stand to. Stephen's broken glasses are also part of his um, this light and dark imagery and very symbolic in nature. Without his glasses, Stephen sees the world as if it were a dark blur, figuratively blinded. He cannot learn. 
and yet he is unjustly punished for not being uh, able to learn, for telling the truth about the reason for this blindness. He quickly realizes the potential dark, irrational cruelty of the clergy. Further, uh, um, in the novel there are recurrent images of darkness in the streets of Dublin. For example, when Stephen makes his way to the brothel district. Here we also see the darkness within Stephen's heart as he wanders willfully towards sin. Later on, the philosophical discussion about the lamp with the Dean of Studies reveals the blindness of this um, solidic compared with the illumination of Stephen's aesthetic thoughts. So, a close reading of the novel will produce many, many more images within these uh, patterns of dichotomy. Joyce's use of them is essential as he uh, constructs his intricate thematic structure of the novel. Another kind of imagery in the novel is made up of re references to colors and names. You will see these references uh, going back into mythological um, history. Colors as Joyce uses them often indicate the political and religious forces which affect Stephen's life and life in general. Similarly, Joyce uses names to evoke various images, especially those which imply animal qualities, providing clues to Stephen's relationships with people. For, for an example of color imagery, note that Dante owns two velvet-backed brushes, one maroon and one green. The maroon brush symbolizes Michael David, the pro-Catholic activist of the Irish Land League. The green-backed brush symbolizes Charles Parnell. Once Parnell was Dante's political hero, par excellence, but after the church den denounced him, she ripped the green cloth from the back of her brush. Other references to color include Stephen's desire to have a green rose, an expression of his creative nature, instead of a white one or a red one, which had a political history. Uh, the symbols of the class, scholastic themes. And it was during the contest where we see that he has failed to uh, compete that contest. Another reference to color imagery can be seen in, in Lynch's use of the term yellow in, in insolence. Instead of using word bloody, Lynch uses the word yellow indicating a sickly, cowardly attitude toward life. The idea of a bloody natural lust for living would be appealing to Lynch. Lynch's name literally means to hang. He has a long, slender, flattened skull, like a hooded reptile, with a reptile-like gaze and a self-embittered soul. Like Lynch, Temple is also representative of his name. Temple considers himself a believer in the power of the mind. He admires Stephen uh, greatly for his independent thinking and he himself tries to think like him and about the problems of the world. Now Crankley, like his name, Carne Carnium meaning skill is Stephen's priest-like companion to whom he confesses his deepest feeling and heaviest feeling. Not that several of Joyce's references also focus on Stephen's image of Cranley, Severed head, Cranley's symbolic significance to Stephen is similar to that of John the Baptist. Uh, the name Cranley also reminds us of the skull on the rector's desk and Joyce emphasis on the shadowy skull of the Jesuit director who queries Stephen about a religious vocation. Uh, concerning the other imagery in the novel, Perhaps the most pervasive is the imagery that pertains to see Stephen exile or specifically his flight from Ireland. The flight imagery begins as early as his first days at Clongwos when Stephen's oppressed feelings are symbolized by a heavy bird flying low through the grey light. 
Later, a greasy football soars like a heavy bird through, through, through the sky. At that time, flight from um, unhappiness seemed impossible for Stephen. But as the novel progress, you will see that Stephen begins to formulate his artistic ideas. The notion of flight seems quite possible. And um, for example, in chapter um, 6, after Stephens renounces the possibility of a religious vocation, he feels a proud sovereignty as he crosses over the Tolka Bridge and his name is called out by his classmates. This incident is followed by another allusion to flight. Later, the girl wading in the sea is described as as delicate as a crane with the, fring the fringes of her drawers like the featherings of soft white down. Her bosom is described as the breast of some um, dark plumaged dove. Her presence in this moment of epiphany enables Stephen to choose art as his vocation. This was all uh, about the imagery and finally we see that, that and note that when Stephen's friends call him, his name seemed to carry a prophecy. He sees a winged from flying, uh, winged from flying above the waves and climbing in the air. The imagery of this hawk-like man flying sunward is at the heart of the flight motive. As Stephen realizes his life's purposes, he sees his soul soaring in the air. He yearns to cry out like an eagle on high. He experiences an instant of wild flight and is delivered free from the bondage of his past. At the end of the novel, Stephen cries out to Daedalus, his old father, old artificer, and perhaps for his own flight to artistic freedom. And this was all about the use of um, imagery and symbolism in the play. Now we will ha have a quick discussion on an autobiographical novel of James Joyce. What are these autobiographical aspects that stand, um, um, you know, stand strong in his writing? Although we have covered them during our discussion based on chapters and uh, we covered them in themes as well, however, separately we are going to deal them for a while. The question of how much autobiographical material Joyce inserted into the fictional character of Stephen Daedalus has long been a matter of debate. A very important and significant question though. Scholars and critics still produce evidence on both sides of the issue. But for the most part, the, the question has been largely resolved through the contribution of Richard, Joyce's definitive biographer, and Joyce's brother, Stanislaus, who wrote his own book about Joyce, My Brother's Keeper. Despite uh, the countless similarities between Joyce's own childhood and that of Stephen uh, Dedalus, uh, Stanislaus Joyce makes it clear that Stephen Dedalus is an imaginary, not a real self-portrait. Significant details exist to verify this view, including Joyce School records at the Wood College and Bewelder, as well as recorded interviews with several of uh, Joyce friends. Uh, Stanislas point out that although Joyce followed his own independent close, uh, development closely, has been his own model and, and chosen to use many incidents from his own experience. He has also transformed and invented many others. One example of such invention is Joyce's portrait of Stephen as a physically weak, covering an innocent victim at Wood College. In contrast to this view of Stephen, Stanislas remembers Joyce as a relatively well-adjusted student and a good athlete who won a variety of cups for his uh, prowess in hurling and walking. And he also recalls that Joy was less isolated, less uh, retentively bookish, and at times less manageable than Stephen. In the Woods College punishment book, uh, we find that Joyce, unlike Stephen, was never pended, 
mistakenly for an incident involving broken glasses. But the book does not record that Joyce received at least two pandit, uh, pandies for forgetting to bring a book to class. And on another occasion, he was pandied uh, for using vulgar language. Um, other variances between Stephen and Joyce are found in Joyce's treatment of Stephen's friends, most of whom are clearly intellectually inferior to him. Stenzelus remembers to the contrary that Joyce's friends provided him with significant mental simultation throughout his adolescent development. Yet another difference between the, the creator and the creation exists in Joy's relationship with his father. Alleman states, in a portrait, Stephen denies that Simon is any real sense um, his father, but James himself had no doubt that he was in every way his father's son. In addition, Stenelis recalled the Cork incident in the novel, where Stephen travels with um, Simon to Cork and states that, and states that Joyce's feelings during the trip were quite different. Unlike Stephen, who was dis disgusted by his father's visit to various pubs, uh, Sten St Stanislas emphasizes that my brother James' letters home at the time were written in a tone of amusement, even when he described going from one bar to another. Uh, Joyce's fictional representations of his friends at, his, at the university are just that, fictional. He changed many of their personalities, invented non-existent dialogues, and deliberately excluded significant individuals in the novel. Clearly, Stephen Dedalus is Joyce's fictional persona, whom he used to express his ideas about the lyrical, apical, and dramatic forms of literature. In conclusion, in spite of the obvious autobiographical similarities, Stephen is a fictional representation of Joyce art. Stephen exists as does the novel, as an example of the author's handiwork, behind which Joyce is invisible, refined out of existence, indifferent, and probably life he had this way in the matter is still standing, concealed somewhere, bearing his nails. Okay, so let's start with our critical reflection based on um, the different types of question that we come across when we are discussing this novel, a portrait. Uh, the important questions will include, um, what is Joyce's attitude to Stephen Dedalus? Well, what did Joyce mean by, this, by the term epiphany? What role do women play in a portrait? A very important question in, of 20th century. What role does Ireland play in the novel? Why does Stephen decide not to become a priest? Well, let's start with what is Joy's attitude to Stephen Dedalus? Joy's attitude to his protagonist is quite complex, on which many critics have disagreed for many years. Critics assume that Stephen Dedalus was a faithful autobiographical portrait of the author. However, we just uh, discussed in autobiographical aspect, um, which is mostly substantiated by the discussions based on uh, Joyce Brothers' uh, um, addition to information, that this is just a persona that he has presented. And the, the writer's figure is invisible. In this view, Stephen is for all intents and purposes the young James Joyce and he is presented in a wholly admirable, even heroic light by the author. The original draft of portrait was called Stephen Hero. Stephen is a hero who breaks through the restrictions of family, church and nation to shape his own destiny according to his inner lights and flights. He overcomes the limitations of his culture and environment and, and soars into a higher realm. Other critics, while accepting that it was Joy's intention to present a heroic Stephen, um, have censored Stephen because he comes across as a bit of a prig and tends to isolate himself from everything around him, not admirable qualities. 
Nothing this discrepancy other critics um, endorsing the perception that Stephen is not entirely the romantic hero that some assumed him to be have claimed that Joyce in fact intended this effect. According to this new, the presentation of Stephen is, is, is quite riddled with deliberately irony that is uh, given inside. Joined, uh, Joyce distances himself and therefore the reader from his protagonist. This is an alternative explanation for the fact that Stephen does not come across as particularly likable as discussed by the writers. He often seems self-absorbed and even arrogant, refusing to be um, associable or to blend in with his community. He seems obsessed with his own theories of art and beauty which separate him from human community rather than uniting him with it. In this view then the portrait is um, an ironic look by the older and presumably wiser James Joyce at his youthful self. Other critics argue that um, neither position is wholly correct. They claim that uh, they, they say that neither position, neither of them is wholly correct. They claim that in Stephen there are elements of the romantic hero as well as the ironic understanding of such a figure. This ironic undercutting of a figure according to this view, Joyce presents a sympathetic portrait of the trials of a sensitive and intellectual young man as he grows up. And the novel is at once an attempt to understand the young man as well as expose some of his faults. Second, a second inquiry that is very important in nature is that what did jo Joyce mean by the term epiphany? By epiphany, Joyce meant a sudden revelation, um, a moment when an ordinary object is perceived in a way that reveals its deeper significance and realization eventually. An epiphany can produce in the perceiver a moment of ecstasy. The word epiphany does not actually appear in a portrait, but Joyce does use it in Stephen Hero, the draft on which a portrait was based. By an epiphany he meant a sudden spiritual manifestation. He believed that it was for the men of letters to record these epiphanies with extreme care, seeing that they themselves are the most delicate and um, evanescent uh, of movements. An epiphany occurs as part of the perception of beauty, Stephen says, as he explains his aesthetic theory to Cranley in a portrait. He bases his story on the work of St. Thomas Aquinas, the medieval Catholic theologian. According to Aquinas, um, the three things needed for beauty are integrity, symmetry and radiance. It is when the last quality, radiance, is perceived that an epiphany occurs. This is how Stephen explains. It is Stephen hero, its soul, its whatness leaps to us from the vestment of its appearance. The soul of the, of the commonest object seems to us radiant. The object achieves its epiphany. When this episode appears in a portrait, the three qualities for Aquinas are altered slightly to become wholeness, harmony and radiance. This, these were the uh, joyous pick of definition on beauty. Stephen explains the instant wherein that supreme quality of beauty, the clear radiance of the aesthetic image is apprehended luminously by the mind which has been arrested by its wholeness and fascinated by its harmony is the luminous silent stasis of aesthetic pleasure or spiritual state. The most famous epiphany in a portrait is the movement Stephen perceives the girl waiting in the strand. A girl stood before him in midstream, alone and still, gazing out to sea. She seemed like one whom magic had changed into the likeness of a strange and beautiful sea. 
sea creature rather. Another epiphany occurs later when Stephen watches the swallows from the steps of the library. The penultimate entry in his journal um, is also an epiphany. Welcome, O life. Since an epiphany, Joyce has Stephen, has Stephen, say in Stephen Hero, can also be a memorable phase of the mind itself. In this case, the epiphany is a sudden realization about life that uplifts the soul and presents its spiritual manifestation. And that was all for today's talk. What we covered today, uh, including the bits of the uh, end of the novel, we uh, tried to discuss choice use of imagery, where we discussed different dichotomous images that he offers and uh, some questions regarding his autobiography. Uh, what we are going to do in our next lecture is that we are going to cover some very important questions and inquiries regarding novel. So I will see you next time, inshallah, in lecture 8. This was all for today. Allah Hafiz.